Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. And we're no longer sitting on the floor. My lounge suite has been recovered, although we are still waiting for some new cushion covers to arrive to complete the look. Anyway, let's get into it. There's been a bit of buzz in the media recently about toxic metals being found in tampons. And I had this clever idea. This is actually covered in aluminium foil. So you're supposed to say lots of metal, but I'm looking on the video and it's looking just white anyway. But just, just imagine you're seeing aluminium foil here and we're having a joke about there's lots and lots of metal. Anyway, now based on the demographics of people who watch my channel, most of you won't have any reason to be personally concerned about this. But I thought I'd cover it because a lot of you may know people who are the right age or the right sex to be using tampons. And because it's a good example of how headlines can be misleading. But let's have a look at a few of the headlines. CNN said, tampons contain lead, arsenic and potentially toxic chemicals. Studies say, here's what to know. The cut said, why are there toxic metals in my tampons? And CBC News said, alarming study finds toxic metals in tampons. Scary stuff. So let's have a look at the study that has prompted all these scary headlines. Here it is here. Tampons as a source of exposure to metalloids with the loids in brackets. Now, just before we go on, for anyone who doesn't know, a metalloid is an element that has some properties of a metal and some properties of a non-metal. And some commonly known metalloids are arsenic and silicon. Back to the paper. Given the title says tampons are a source of exposure, you would think that the study determined how much of these metals you would be exposed to if you used a tampon. That's not what they did. The authors made no attempt whatsoever to determine how much of the various metals you would be exposed to. What they actually did was determine the metal content of the tampons. And the way they did this was to cut off a bit of the tampon and use a technique known as acid digestion to completely dissolve the tampon material and then determine the metal content of the subsequent solution with inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Now, this is a well-established technique for determining the level of trace quantities of metals. I've actually used it to determine the proportion of silver nanoparticles taken up by bacteria cells. Acid digestion uses highly concentrated nitric acid at high temperatures to convert organic matter into carbon dioxide and water and to assure that all metals present in the substrate end up in solution. And the reason they use nitric acid as opposed to hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid is because all nitrate salts are water soluble and this means all metals will end up in solution. Needless to say, when you place a tampon in your vagina, it doesn't dissolve. It just absorbs liquid and swells. And based on the ads that you see on TV, the liquid it absorbs is blue. But I digress. The authors of the paper have not done any experiments to determine whether or not there is any exposure to the metals that they found in the tampons. Tampons are generally made from either cotton or rayon. Both of these substrates contain cellulose. This image shows a structure of cellulose. As you can see, it contains a number of hydroxy groups, which are the OH, as you can see. These have a slight negative charge, and this means that metal ions, which have a positive charge, will be drawn to them, making it hard for the metal ions to leach out of the tampon. In fact, products derived from cellulose are actually being developed to remove toxic metal ions from wastewater. The authors of the paper could have done some additional research to determine 
what proportion, if any, of the metal ions were likely to leach out of the tampons. The pH of the vagina is typically 4.5, which is mildly acidic, but this does increase to 7.4, which is mildly basic or alkaline if you are menstruating because 7.4 is the pH of blood. The authors could have simply soaked intact tampons in buffered saline solutions at pH 4.5 and 7.4 for, let's say, eight hours at 37 degrees Celsius. They then could have removed the tampons and analysed the concentration of the various metals in the remaining solution. But they didn't do this. But let's for the moment ignore the fact that they didn't determine how much metal, if any, leached out of the tampons. Let's look at what they actually found. Now, a lot of the metals that they found are nothing to worry about. In fact, a lot of them are essential minerals. But they did find three metals or metalloids that are considered toxic. And I'll just read you what they said about this in the conclusion of the paper. To our knowledge, our study is the first to assess concentration of metals in tampons, despite the potential for substantial vaginal absorption of metals and the widespread and frequent use of tampons amongst menstruators. We found measurable concentrations of all 16 metals assessed including the toxic metals lead, geometric mean equals 120 nanograms per gram, cadmium, geometric mean equals 6.74 nanograms per gram, and arsenic, geometric mean equals 2.56 nanograms per gram. We also found elevated concentrations of calcium, geometric mean equals 39,000 nanograms per gram, and zinc, geometric mean equals 52,000 nanograms per gram in tampons. Further research is necessary to replicate our findings and determine whether metals can leach out of tampons and cross the vaginal epithelium into systemic circulation. Our findings point towards the need for regulations requiring the testing of metals in tampons by manufacturers. This is especially important considering that we found measurable quantities of several toxic metals, including lead, which has no known safe exposure level. Wow, that all sounds pretty scary. Well, not the calcium and zinc, obviously, because they're both essential minerals, but definitely the toxic metals. Of course, as we've already discussed, they could have easily done the research to determine if, in fact, any of the materials can leach out of the tampons. But what about the levels that they found? Are they cause for concern? Just before we answer that, if you're wondering why these metals are found in tampons, it's because they're found in soil and cotton is grown in soil. They are also found in your clothes and in most foods and beverages for the same reason. And you will also inhale them when you breathe in household dust. So according to Google, a tampon typically weighs about one gram. So based on this research, the average amount of lead in a tampon will be 120 nanograms, and a nanogram is one billionth of a gram. The average amount of arsenic will be 2.56 nanograms, and the average amount of cadmium will be 6.74 6.74 nanograms. Assuming you used five tampons a day, your potential exposure, if all your tampons disintegrate inside you, will be 600 nanograms of lead, 12.8 nanograms of arsenic, and 33.7 nanograms of cadmium. To put this into perspective, the allowable limit of these metals in one litre of tap water, which most people would consume in a day, is 15,000 nanograms of lead, 10,000 nanograms of arsenic, and 5,000 nanograms of cadmium. 
So the amount of these toxic metals that you could be exposed to via tampons is a small proportion of what you could be exposed to from just drinking water. And then, of course, there are all the other sources you'll be exposed to. So in summary, if you are someone who uses tampons or know someone who uses tampons, there is no reason to be concerned. Anyone who tells you is, is talking bollocks. There is no evidence that any of these metals will leach out of the tampons. And even if they did, your exposure level is likely to be considerably less than what you are exposed to from other things you consume and inhale. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to join the cool kids and stay informed, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.